Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started then? Okay, thanks everybody for coming out uh, this afternoon and, and finding us up here at the, uh, in the top of the JW Marriott. So today uh, is the, this session is the OpenXR Birds of a Feather session. Uh, my name is Brent Ensko and I'm lead architect, XR architect for Intel and I'm the working group chair for OpenXR. Uh, I guess I drew the short straw today because I got the dreaded after lunch session. So hopefully uh, we've got some exciting news to share with you in a couple of demos. So hopefully we can keep you guys uh, enthused and, and awake for the next hour or so. Uh, so the exciting news that we have to share with you is that we launched the 1.0 release of the OpenXR specification, which is the result of a lot of hard work by a lot of very talented engineers over the course of the last almost three years. Uh, I'll start by discussing what OpenXR is, uh, why we need yet another standard, and where we are with it today. And then we'll check out some demos from uh, Vario and Microsoft, and then I'll talk about what's next for OpenXR. So following up on our release of a provisional specification at GDC four months ago, uh, earlier this week, Kronos announced the release of the OpenXR 1.0 specification. Uh, the working group drove really hard uh, finalizing the specification in time for SIGGRAPH, uh, nailing down the exact functionality and incorporating the feedback that we got from the provisional release uh, we made available uh, back in March. Uh, the 1.0 release is, is really a big deal. The release we did earlier this year, the provisional release, uh, we put out with the knowledge that we had the ability to make changes, you know, potentially drastic changes if the developer community or the implementers ourselves found major issues with the, uh, with the specification. Uh, with this 1.0 release, we've locked down the API and are committing to support the included functionality going forward so that the developers can have confidence that the included features will be there when they go to implement their applications. So today I'll cover what OpenXR is, give a brief history of the development of OpenXR, cover what the problems are we're trying to solve, where we are in the timeline of development. Uh, then we'll jump into a brief overview of the OpenXR API. Then I'll step aside and we'll have Vario and Microsoft come up and provide a couple of demos of OpenXR in action. And then I'll come back and talk about what's next and conclude the talk. And just a brief aside, uh, the talk assumes you know a little bit about AR and VR. We won't go into too much depth. Uh, but you know a little bit about programming and very basic real-time rendering, nothing about the specification process, and nothing about any of the other Chrono specifications. So what is OpenXR? So OpenXR is a royalty-free open standard that provides high-performance access to augmented reality and virtual reality platforms and devices. Uh, as a note, I'll be using the phrase or the term XR uh, throughout the talk. This includes all the technologies around AR, VR, MR, and anything similar. Okay, so I've provided a definition, so what does that actually mean? So to understand what that means, let's give a brief history of where we started with OpenXR. Um, back in the early 2000, uh, sorry, early 2016, among the first widely available platforms on this current wave of VR were the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive, which is great. This brand new VR ecosystem had a couple of different platforms to choose from, and consumers would have options to, uh, on which hardware platform to buy and to use to experience VR. Uh, but for those consumers to be interested in doing something with VR, you actually had to be able to do something with them. You actually needed to have applications uh, to you know, drive the sales of these platforms. The challenge for developers is that each of these software development kits uh, for each of these platforms were different. But if you think about it, you know, VR and AR for that matter, tasks like you know, get the head position, get where the hands are in the real world, uh, are there buttons pressed on the controller I'm using, uh, tell me when the image I'm drawing on the screen is going to appear. These are all common functionality across all of these VR and AR platforms. And so right off at the beginning, we already have a fragmented ecosystem. And this makes it a problem for everybody in a number of different ways. First, it increases development time and therefore costs. You have to implement separate paths in your applications to handle each of the different platforms. And each of the vendors' uh, platforms can have slightly different APIs. Um, 
It also increases the validation overhead because each of these paths could introduce new bugs and bugs that would only appear on that particular platform. And so now you're having to go and test every platform and all the different code paths, and this increases um, cost and time. And so time and resources of the developers are really spent um, on developing this one platform, sorry, one title across multiple platforms, and this impacts developers' ability to deliver more and more content. And one of the things that we see that's holding back VR adoption is you know, lots and lots of content that would be available. And you know, this becomes a problem just with a couple of platforms in the very beginning. Uh, as you look in just a few years, we already have a number of major XR runtimes in the marketplace and a number of prominent ones even I've left out. Um, for VR on the PC, you have the Rift, you have Steam VR and Valve's Index and the HTC Vive and Vive Pro, uh, Windows Mixed Reality with Microsoft, you have all-in-ones from Oculus like the Go and the Quest, uh, mobile devices, all-in-ones on the augmented reality side from the HoloLens to the Magic Leap device, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So developing a single application to serve all of these runtimes and devices and platforms becomes a real challenge. And so that's where OpenXR comes in. So recognizing this problem, a group of companies got together uh, in late 2016 and early 2017 to form the OpenXR Working Group in Kronos. And despite the problem originating with VR, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were working towards a fully supporting AR as well, hence the inclusion of both VR and AR in our logo. So to understand the problem more visually, we've made this diagram. The current AR and VR markets are quite small, so developers need to reach as large an audience as possible, meaning they must try to support as many platforms as possible. And in this diagram, you have a group of applications that are either talking through game engines, have developed their own game engine, or maybe they're even potentially talking directly to the vendor runtimes. Uh, each of these vendor-specific paths are frustratingly different from each other. And so game engines can hide some of these differences, but even they and the developers that are using them can benefit from all of these different runtimes using a common set of interfaces. So OpenXR seeks to unify and create a single common API and a single device interface, going from the mess of specialization support for each platform to single path support across all platforms. So let's take a one step closer view of a tip, typical VR software stack. So you have an application that either directly or through a game engine or maybe a browser through WebXR, uh, these talk directly to the graphics uh, and other system APIs. It also talks to something we, we term a VR runtime. And this runtime is supplied by the VR platform vendor. Uh, the runtime is responsible for things like handling the tracking, compositing the final image out to the HMD, and handling controller input. Uh, subsequently, the VR runtime uh, talks through to the VR hardware to get the raw information like the tracking coordinates and whether the physical buttons have been pressed on the physical controllers. Uh, the interfaces that I've highlighted here in red are the VR APIs, and these are the APIs that OpenXR seeks to standardize across the vendor uh, platforms. So just to give you another view, this is kind of a flow of information to and from the application through the whole XR system. Uh, as you can see through the OpenXR API, the runtime would send things like controller state, pose information, uh, and input events to the application. And in return, the application sends the pre-distorted images to display and the uh, information on haptic output to the runtime. Uh, through the device plugin extension, the vendor hardware would send the controller state and raw pose information to the runtime, and the runtime would send the post distorted images and haptics information to the actual VR hardware. Uh, it's important to note that OpenXR is not replacing the runtimes, it's merely the mechanism for the runtimes to expose their features via a cross platform API. So to emphasize a couple of approaches for runtimes to support OpenXR, this diagram shows uh, one runtime that uses the device plugin extension and one that does not. Uh, in the, the discussions around the device plugin extension and whether it should be part of the core API, there were like two features, uh, two main reasons why we felt that all VR platforms could even support uh, this device plugin extension. Uh, one was security, 
Some platforms have extremely strict security rules, making it uh, hard to support arbitrary hardware devices being plugged in. Uh, and on some platforms, alternative hardware just doesn't make sense on certain you know, all-in-one devices where there's not really a place you could plug in any other hardware. So stepping back, uh, just to give you some insight into what our philosophy was when we were developing OpenXR, uh, we looked to, as I mentioned before, enable both AR and VR applications uh, because we want to make sure that we were able to support both going forward. I think there's more we could do on the AR side, but we can talk about that uh, later in the talk. Uh, two, we wanted to be future-proof. We wanted to make sure we weren't baking anything into the first version of the specification that we would regret later. Three, don't try to predict where the technology is going. We tend to be very bad at it, so we wanted to build around a flexible architecture so we could extend it going forward. And four, XR is one of the most performance critical use cases on any system today. So we wanted to make sure that uh, we enabled optimal, optimized um, access to the underlying platforms and systems. You know, re reducing hiding, sorry, reducing and hiding latency in the system is critical to the success in products and applications. And it's just key to making sure people don't get sick when we use uh, our systems. So where are we on the timeline? So as I mentioned, we started off in late 2016, um, and we've been providing updates periodically, uh, either at GDC or here at SIGGRAPH. Um, we just released the 1.0 specification, as I mentioned on Monday. Uh, we have some other things coming up on the timeline for a full release, but I'll talk about those a little bit later. Right now, I want to talk a little bit about the high-level concepts. I'm not going to dive too deep because I want to leave time for the, the demos to, to show off what uh, OpenXR is capable of, but I want to give just a few highlights. Uh, first off is the OpenXR loader. So this is similar to other Kronos APIs, if you're familiar with those. Uh, it's a separate component to be able to support multiple runtimes on one system. So you may have various vendor platforms plugged into your system at the same time. The loader is the mechanism the app would talk through to communicate to a particular runtime. And there can be mechanisms on how it chooses which runtime or which underlying platform to use from just picking one to some more intelligent decisions based on which extensions the application is, is using. Um, but it's also important to note some systems won't have a loader if they're just going to have one, uh, one runtime on them. Uh, API layers and extensions, I won't go into too much details, but basically we've made this uh, ex both extensible by adding extensions like other Kronos APIs. There's also the notion of uh, adding an API layer, so if you want to put in a validation layer or a tracing layer, uh, you can inject, very similar to DLL shimming, you can inject things between the application making calls and the underlying runtime uh, executing them. Uh, the instance. So the instance in OpenXR is the application's representation of the underlying runtime, and this is how the application talks to the runtime. So you can create multiple instances if it's supported by the runtime, uh, and the instance specifies the app information layers and extensions. Uh, the system, so you create this, ex you create an instance to the platform. The system is a group of physical devices that can be grouped together into a logical setup. You could think of it as, you know, a headset and a pair of controllers or maybe headset controllers and other types of trackers. Um, it could have display, it could have input, it could have tracking. The XR Git system also returns the type of form factor that's going to be used. And right now we have just two form factors. Uh, we're supporting handheld display, so if you're doing camera pass through AR, uh, like you see on phones today, uh, that would be that type of form factor, and then the other would be head mounted display, stereoscopic display. Um, view configurations, they are, uh, Currently, uh, minimal just to mono and stereo for the two cases I just mentioned, but we are looking to the future where you might have cave-like environments uh, also supported with the API. And so having these two features enables, enables us to have a, a bit more flexibility going forward. So the session. The session is how the application indicates to the platform that it's ready to start outputting VR and AR frames. Um, so the application tells the runtime it wants to enter an interactive state for a session by, by telling it to begin session, and it ends it with end session. 
And I'm not going to go into details about the session life cycle. If you talk to other members of the working group, we spend long and, and hard days trying to figure out exactly how this should work. I just wanted to throw it up here. It's in the specification. Um, but we did put a lot of thought into how an application moves from an idle state into when it's ready to receive frames from, uh, or when the platform is ready to receive frames of the application, when it's visible, when it's focused, et cetera. Uh, I won't go into too much detail on events. Uh, they're similar to how other applications use events, and so I won't go into too much detail there. Uh, the other critical part of the immersive nature of VR is the ability to interact with the environments that and manipulate the environment you are uh, in, inside. So in this next section, I'm just going to give a, a, a brief highlights of, of what we've done with the input and haptics. Uh, so basically the goal is that you, you want to be able to do something like when the user clicks the A button, you know, it results in the user teleporting to someplace else in the environment. And so the input in OpenXR goes through a layer of abstraction built around input actions. So you would define the physical buttons from the input controller separately from the actions that you want them to, uh, want them to do. And so the application will suggest bindings to the runtime. So you can say, okay, I want button A to teleport and I want the trigger to fire. Uh, but it's ultimately up to the runtime to bind these input sources with the, the actions. Uh, and there's a few reasons why we decided to do that. And I'll talk about that in a slide coming up. And so what you get is uh, we provide currently in the core API a series of interaction profiles, and these are really a collection of input and output sources on physical devices. Uh, and runtimes can support multiples of these. And so, you know, you can have this fancy controller that could be used for the left and right hand of the user. Uh, it has four buttons that are click buttons. It has a trigger that you can click, you can touch, or you can squeeze it, and it would give you a value from one to zero. And it could also potentially output some haptic feedback as well. And so as I mentioned, we've already predefined some interaction profiles for some of the current products that are out there today from uh, the Daydream to Vive and Vive Pro to the Microsoft Mixed Reality controllers, the Xbox controller, the Go and Touch controllers from Oculus, and the Valve Index controllers. So I mentioned that it's ultimately up to the runtime to determine what actions are bound to what physical buttons on the controller. And there's a couple of reasons why we made that decision. Uh, one is uh, the quote that the working group liked to use, that dev teams are ephemeral, are ephemeral, but games last forever. So you could have a game that was built you know, a decade ago, controllers that no longer exist, but you may still want to play that game. So if there's the ability for the runtime to understand what you were wanting to bind the buttons to and what actions there are, it can update that to the latest and greatest controllers. Uh, the other reason at, that we wanted to allow this is that runtime, you, you wanted to also allow the user to do mapping as well, right? It, maybe they don't like having the jump button be the A button, they want it to be the X button. Um, so it allows the runtimes to allow the user to make customization uh, for the, without the original application even understanding that that has been done. Uh, there may be some future controller that's developed that the application had no knowledge of at the, when it was developed, and so this, you know, freeing up the bindings allows for handling that. And there's also the accessibility devices for um, being able to input the map, mappings appropriately for those devices. And so it looks something like, uh, you know, you get a click on button A on the left-handed controller of this fancy controller. Uh, then the OpenXR runtime would take that, map it to what the action actually is. Does it explode? Does it teleport, et cetera? And then it would result in the, the action in the application and the user actually teleporting. Um, we also have some, some basics on haptics. I won't go into too much details here, other than we do uh, allow starting and stopping frequency and some other controls around uh, haptic feedback. Uh, so that's it for the core API. Like I said, I'm not going to go into too much details. I want to spend time uh, on the demos. But I do want to talk about a little bit about the extensibility. So as I said, you know, this is an emerging market. There's lots of different ways the market can move forward. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were building around extensibility. And so we're following the, the standard Kronos uh, 
extensibility framework. And so we have the core standard that we had some of the features I talked about already. We have some KHR extensions. These are extensions expected to be supported by the majority of the runtimes uh, that will be provided. There are EXT extensions where multiple companies can get together and expose features that are common between multiple runtimes. And then if a particular vendor has specific features they want to expose, then they can expose those through a vendor extension. And so we have, I think, 16 Kronos extensions that we released at the same time as the core 1.0 specification. I think there's a few EXTs, and I think Vario has one as well. Um, but these are, um, I kind of grouped them together to give kind of a, an overview of like how they, they uh, fit into the big picture. We have some that are specific to a particular platform like Android. Uh, we have APIs around supporting the graphics APIs that on the system that you're running on from D3D to OpenGL to Vulkan. Um, we also have some specifics around composition layers, um, exposing a visibility mask if you want to do some optimization and some time conversion functions. So what hasn't made it in? So one of the things that I talked about at the beginning was the device layer plugin. So um, the top priority for the working group was really about solving the API fragmentation problem and simplifying software development. So we basically wanted to try to get that out as quickly as possible, so we had to, to basically punt on the device plugin layer. Um, so, but we do have that still on the list of things that we want to support going forward. We've made some work on the architecture and what it looked like, but we just had to make a priority call on when and what would make it for the 1.0 release. Uh, there are a list of things that we're considering for 1.1 as well as extensions. Many of them, I'm sure, are obvious next steps for VR and AR and things that I'm, are probably on the top of your mind. I won't list them here. We don't tend to talk about the things that uh, we're thinking about going into the future ones. Uh, but feel free to send, up, send us your list of requests uh, through the feedback channels uh, we'll be providing a little bit later. I think uh, some of the demos may also talk about some of the thoughts that our member companies are having around extensions as well. So, without further ado, we'll bring uh, Remy up from Vario, uh, and he will give you a demo of uh, OpenXR running on their headset. <laughs> Assuming this all works. Well, I had one slide I wanted to show, but it looks like it didn't make it to, uh, when I had it in the computer, but I closed it and it's gone. <laughs> I wanted to, uh, let me, uh, I have it here on my phone, but I can't show it to you. Anyway, so I just uh, wanted to talk a little bit about um, Vario and um, this demo. So, what, what I'm going to show you is a um, this is XR, this is a Vario XR1 device. We announced it at uh, AWE, and um, it um, it's the second device. We already have a Vario VR1 so, or VR device. It's on sale since uh, February, and uh, um, the XR device uh, is is an MR device, meaning you can. Uh, um, that bring the real world in, into the virtual world. So the demo I put together is pretty simple. It's actually uh, the idea of uh, there is a virtual world around us we can't see, but uh, it's there. But if I can actually put a portal in between the two worlds, you can walk and see the virtual world through the portal when you're in the real world. Uh, or when you're in the virtual world, you can't see the real world. So it's kind of 
confusing what's real and what's not real. So it's a very simple demo, and it's entirely written uh, with uh, OpenXO. Uh, we do have uh, one extension, as mentioned, because the Vario device uh, specificities is that we have two screens per eye. We have the center screen, is called the focus screen, and the context screen. The focus screen is uh, giving you 2020 eye resolution, so you have exactly the same resolution in the headset than um, in real, um, than through your eyes. And that's, to us, it was fundamental to get to this point before we can uh, go ahead and um, and solve the MR problem. So VR1 offers that, and MR adds, uh, adds to it. Uh, so in order to do that, we have an extension in OpenXR, which is the quad view extension, which enables not only stereo, but two views per eye. And so the engine has to, well, it's an option, it's an extension. You can send one if you want, but if you want a high resolution, you have to send two. Um, and the beauty of it is we work with Unreal Engine, and uh, Unreal Engine has created their own OpenXR driver. And in the OpenXR driver, we recognize the extension of it to our runtime, and automatically they will generate those views for you. So it's transparent for the application. If you write an Unreal Engine game, you just, uh, uh, you're going to have the high resolution um, working on, on Vario. And um, uh, to, to me, it was really important that we um, do the demo we did today. We have the demo running through Unreal Engine. Um, we don't need that anymore. <laughs> uh, the, the demo running through Unreal Engine because uh, OpenXR, I mean, we can have, everybody can write an API, a lot of programmers can, and it's uh, a call for action now the API is available. But um, it's very fundamental to me that the major engines actually Unreal um, Engine um, is as proven as using as a, as a proof of uh, usability of OpenXR for, uh, for a major game engine to, to use to connect to all the XR devices. Um, inside the specification, you'll see there is uh, something interesting. It's the uh, blend mode, um, the um, blend mode that, that you're going to use when you start your application, how you want the real world to blend with the virtual world. That's called the blend mode. Uh, uh, it's not an extension, it's in the spec. And there's uh, opaque meanings, you don't see anything outside. There's um, add, is add, so you add things on top of uh, outside. Um, and there is alpha, which means you can blend any pixel uh, with inside outside with the virtual world, real world. Um, the XR device supports uh, uh, all of those modes, but most likely this demo is in alpha mode. Some of the devices only support add because you can't remove the outside, it just goes through anyway. And some devices are just VR devices, so we can't. We can't blend the outside. So now we should uh, be able to go in there. Real world, and uh, somewhere in there, there is a photo. And that photo is in the virtual world, as you can see around us. And the person can see what's that, what's that being invisible to us for all that time. It's actually a demo scene from Unreal, that's a basic VR demo scene you load in Unreal. And, and, uh, Now I am in the virtual world and now it's the real world. And, and that's very confusing because I don't know if this is the real world or the ah. <laughs> oh, okay, so that's good. You know what the, the trick would be that that this, there would be then when you go in the virtual world, then the real world disappears and there's another virtual world and you're stuck in some kind of loop and so I feel more safe going back to the real world actually and um, looking at the virtual world that way. So, anyway, so a simple demo. It's only one blueprint. There's not one line of C++ code. It's running on one engine. It could work with any device uh, using OpenXR device. No, um, I, I guess that's a good uh, example of uh, how easy it's going to be for developers to 
uh, to use OpenXR with the game engine. <laughs> now, there's no latency. That's the magic of Vario. So you can uh, check that out for yourself later at the, uh, at the event, the social event later at 5.30. Thank you. Okay, next up we're gonna have Microsoft, we're gonna have Alex Turner demo uh, what they are doing with OpenXR as well. Can you hear me with this mic? Not yet? Let's see. Yeah, if it doesn't work. Oh, hello? Okay, cool. Yeah, just give me one sec to switch over here. Set this up. Okay. Yeah, so just go through one demo, a uh, quick slide here. Um, yeah, so uh, we're really excited at Microsoft to be part of OpenXR. Um, we believe really for mixed reality that uh, being open is the only way that we're gonna escape a lot of the pitfalls we had kind of in the mobile era as an industry with closed ecosystems across closed stores, closed browser platforms, and closed developer APIs. So being able to get to, uh, let me turn this one off. Let's turn it for you. Oh, I'll hide it over here. Being able to get to open platforms for all of the above um, is really what's going to enable the success of uh, mixed reality VR and AR across the industry and avoid, um, avoid the fragmentation uh, that we would otherwise see. Um, and so this was the kind of press release as part of Monday when OpenXR 1.0 was announced, um, getting to where you know, we've actually released our runtime now. So um, what I'm going to show you today is what you can download uh, today first. You can get um, the Windows Mixed Reality runtime. Uh, and get this going for uh, desktop headsets, desktop VR headsets that you have, um, as well as starting to install this on HoloLens too. Um, and today, we already kind of showed a GDC, the kind of side-by-side -side demo of how this all works together on two different VR headsets. So today, I wanted to show um, a mixed reality headset. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna jump straight into VS. Um, to actually show you kind of like where the code is coming from here, uh, let's get out of this, duplicate. So uh, if you go to chronos.org slash openxr, that's kind of the main landing page um, for all of the, uh, the spec stuff, all of the reference guides, everything you want to get started uh, with OpenXR. Uh, and there's also links to the runtimes that you can download today. And this list is about to get longer. There's a whole set of vendor companies who are starting to implement. Um, but if you click here and you go to uh, the Microsoft site, you can get directly here. It's aka.ms slash openxr, or just find the link there. Uh, and you'll have all the developer info for getting started specifically with uh, the Microsoft runtime. Um, it gives you a little overview and links out to the spec and tells you how to get started kind of both on HoloLens 2, which I'll be showing today, uh, as well as how to get started on desktop headsets. Um, and specifically here, um, there's a sample app that we have uh, that kind of demonstrates some of the core concepts of OpenXR. It just is pure core OpenXR, doesn't use any extensions, so it would work on anybody's uh, runtime. And it, it supports both uh, desktop VR as well as supporting a HoloLens. And so if you go in here, you can see um, this is up on GitHub. And so if you were to clone this, you could open this up right now. Um, so that's what we're going to do. So I've already cloned this down here. Um, and you know, I'm not going to walk through all the code. Um, if you get that quick reference guide that's up there, you'll kind of see basically kind of a bird's eye view of what's going on with the spec and how different parts fit together, uh, what it is you do first to get an instance and then a session, all the stuff that, uh, that uh, we showed to earlier today. Um, but uh, basically, you can see that same thing here in basic XR app, kind of the, the main uh, run function here that goes through it, sets up the instance, sets up the actions, um, initializes your session, and goes into the main uh, render loop. So if you want to take a look at this, go ahead and clone that project. I'll have the URL again um, at the end, how you can get to that. Um, but what I'm going to show is here, um, if I put this on the device, and actually, first thing, I'm just going to turn this on. We're gonna live stream the video from here so you can see it. 
just to get this going for a sec. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to connect to the uh, device portal, um, which is a little server running on the headset when you're in developer mode. Um, so you can get going here. Uh, let's see here. It's still kind of logging in. Oh, here we go. You should be able to see this here. Um, just because it's streaming the video, the video itself is about three seconds kind of behind what I'm seeing, um, but right in the headset. You know, you, you'll be able to try this demo out later. It's all synced up. Um, so here, so I'm in the, the home environment. So what I'm going to do actually first, um, I'm going to go back into Visual Studio and uh, go here, this up here, uh, and I'll deploy this. And so uh, let me set this going here to the device. Um, so we're deploying over the USB cable just because it's faster kind of for demo purposes. I wanted to show real bits going uh, straight to the device. Um, when you're back in your office, you can deploy over Wi-Fi, disconnect, and uh, walk around. Um, and so, yeah, so like basically while this is deploying, I'll kind of talk through um, like some of the stuff we were doing, if you've seen kind of the .9 API, um, a lot of the 1.0 stuff that we have here is basically the same. Um, but we took some of the feedback kind of from the engine partners as, for example, Epic was implementing um, uh, all of this into the engine, all, all their OpenXR support. Um, you know, they realized that the way they implemented it, they ended up having um, separate plugins, for example, for, uh, you know, for rendering for the core XR stuff as well as for input. Um, and so, you know, we were able to take that feedback between 0.9 and 1.0 and ensure that you could here create the actions earlier on uh, in, this, in this session, like early, earlier on in your app's lifecycle before you actually even create the session. Um, and this enables you to kind of decouple the rendering plugin from the input plugin. Um, so that's just kind of one of the few, like, or the set of things that we did between 0.9 and 1.0 um, that don't impact you too much if you actually started to experiment with 0.9, but it actually gives you that flexibility to architect your engine the way you want. Okay, so we'll go back here. Uh, the app deployed and it's running. So again, this is that app that you can get yourself and it uses 100% core features of uh, the spec, no, no extra extensions uh, needed here. This is all the stuff that you can do just purely with the spec as it exists today. Um, and so, you know, the, with the input sources, this is like, you know, user hand left and user hand right. Um, and basically the, the one thing, the main thing that puts a cube at each one, um, we have this notion of a grip pose, which is kind of the core kind of central part within the hand um, where you would actually grab something. And when you actually detect kind of a, a press, it actually moves this one cube in the world to that place. So this is, this is kind of just the simple thing you can see in that app. Uh, and again, like this same code, if this was a motion controller, if this was like a VR headset and you had a motion controller, again, if it's in your left hand or your right hand, you'd be able to use those same paths to actually decide, hey, when is the left hand or the right hand and having a press. Um, um, and so this is the main stuff that the app does, and you're able to place this here and move around, but this is pretty simple, right? So like, this is basic stuff um, that you can do, again, across any device because it's in all the core, uh, the core uh, SDK functionality. But we wanted to show today was kind of where we expect to be by the end of the year. Um, so we have another app on the device that I can show you, which has a bunch of our prototype extensions. Um, and these are extensions that aren't public yet. They're not um, kind of out there for folks to use, um, but they're the extensions we expect to have by the end of the year. Um, and we're working with a bunch of the other companies inside the OpenXR working group to try to really make sure this, these aren't just all Microsoft extensions, but they're actually common cross-vendor extensions that everyone who wants to do hand tracking and eye tracking and meshing um, and uh, spatial anchors and all that kind of stuff can share. Um, just again, to reduce that fragmentation, even for the extensions. Um, so I'll go back here uh, to the home environment. And uh, if I go here again, uh, and then I can launch uh, OpenXR, a HoloLens demo. So again, this is a demo using some internal stuff that will be public um, over time. Um, but we just wanted to show kind of both what you can do today and what you could do um, once all this is available. Um, so here you can see that there's like gems uh, floating around. Um, and now when I reach my hand out, you can see it's not just uh, that cube, but this is actually kind of the full mesh of my hand. And we have a shader we've applied to kind of make this um, this, this effect on your hand, and it gives the user kind of confidence on, hey, this is where your hand is in the world. You actually saw just before this when I was in the shell on the device, a different shader um, that, that they use there to kind of give you, again, that confidence that, okay, the user knows they can interact uh, with this hand. And for example, if I go here and I grab this gem, I can move it around. 
I can move around with that, and I can, I can drop it, and I can place it um, where it goes. Um, I can also kind of see here, actually you can see it better with maybe the blue one. I go up and I kind of poke it, so you can see we put this, kind of just for the visibility for developers, we put this little sphere collider on the front, um, but you can kind of see when I'm poking it, so you can imagine if I had made a button, um, you can use that articulated hand data coming through to determine uh, when you're actually able to, uh, to interact, when you're actually pushing the button. Um, and you also notice some of them are uh, rotating and some aren't. So like right now, this blue one's rotating, and that's actually because my eye is looking at it over to the left. And so if I look over at the one on the right with the yellow, that one starts to rotate. If I look over here, actually if I kind of like line them up, I look at both of them. Actually, I know all three of them are rotating, and if I look away, they stop. Um, so yeah, so eye tracking, you can do subtle effects with that. And again, uh, we have, um, again, I don't want to put words in other people's mouth, but I'll just say we have a set of vendors who are all working together within the group, um, not just Microsoft, who want to see common eye tracking extensions come to be. Um, uh, you know, Toby and others have been working on this, and we're proposing some of that stuff very early on in the working group, and they've been kind of pioneering having an eye tracking extension, and we want to make sure that we don't come up just with our own that we actually have, again, this common, common extension across whoever um, whoever is interested in this time frame. Um, and one other thing too, right, so you can see like my hand mesh is able to render here and it represents kind of the exact shape and kind of also the detected size of my hand. Um, but also just with the environment, like this table here, if I do the tap, I can kind of see uh, going out into the world um, the shape that the device understands, the mesh that it does. And if I kind of look over here, like as the device will detect more and more, I'm still on this little tether for the video streaming I'm doing, but um, you know, when you see the demo later, you'll be able to disconnect and walk wherever you want. Um, you can get that mesh basically of what the device knows about the world. And this is how you would do things like placement. When you build like a physics engine into your app, um, you could have the user place something against the mesh. Um, and finally, the last thing, it's harder to demo kind of on stage, you have to take my word for it, but um, when I'm moving this around and I kind of place it here, let's say I like place it on the, on the surface here, um, a spatial anchor is being created um, where that's being placed. And so that spatial anchor means that, you know, even though this device is inside out, and you saw this, I'm walking around, the device is still kind of learning about the meshing. Um, one of the extensions we have is about unbounded uh, coordinate systems, or unbounded frames of reference, to be able to say, as you walk around, um, the device will still be learning, and it needs to adjust its coordinate systems uh, as you go. And if you had an anchor all the way back here and you walked maybe 20 meters, there might be lever arm effects and you would kind of lose quality. You'd get a lot of uh, jumping around of content over there. And so the unbounded uh, reference space means that you can stabilize near where you are. Even if you walk 100 meters in that direction, go up two floors, and you have a continuous map, it's okay because over there, the coordinates will stabilize near you. But it means that the stuff back where you started might move off the mark. And so if you're doing that, um, being able to place these spatial anchors on a piece of content, like I can put this here, and if I was to kind of walk far away, uh, and come back and I was to go look for that again, even if it moved in, you, numerically within that coordinate system, I'd still be able to independently locate this, independently locate that, because the device knows to track each one on its own. Um, and so this was just kind of a quick preview of you know, hand tracking, including hand mesh, uh, hand, uh, eye tracking, uh, the spatial meshing that you saw here, as well as the ability to place uh, spatial anchors. So I'll take this off here. And so here, uh, basically, this is the, the core stuff in the spec, right? So if you look at the left column, these are all the things that the core, you know, OpenXR 1.0 spec delivers today when you're not using any extensions. All the stuff kind of uh, Brent went through in the slides, setting up systems and sessions, getting reference spaces, um, doing mono and stereo, getting swap chains, composition layers, all the stuff that all our VR and AR APIs had been doing, but we're doing the same sort of thing, but in slightly different ways. And so that left column is all the areas where we've agreed now across the industry to figure out how we want to do this so that engines can just write their code there once. And then the right side is what we showed today. So for the first two rows, that unbounded reference space, uh, and for actually putting spatial anchors in your world, uh, we currently actually have a PR up on GitHub right now um, for adding at least a Microsoft-specific extension um, to get you going today uh, for that kind of stuff. Um, but for those two and for all the rest you know, that we demoed, we quickly, by the end of the year, we want to get to full parity for all of this, and that's kind of what we've committed to, but for as many of those as possible um, where folks want to, uh, we want to get to not just MSFT extensions, but EXT extensions, cross-vendor extensions, where multiple vendors have agreed on the right way to, to do this that all of you can uh, implement once and support in everyone's device. And so, uh, if you specifically are excited about this and you want to get started, um, again, you go to aka.ms slash openxr. Um, whether you have a HoloLens 2 or not, if you don't have one, you can use the HoloLens 2 simulator, uh, and you'll be able to, again, write your apps and deploy them into that, uh, into that emulator, uh, and you can run that. 
Um, and, but again, either way, you could either do it on HoloLens 2 or just Windows Mixed Reality headsets um, or Vario headsets or with, with their runtime and everybody who's in Collabora and everyone who's gonna be having all these runtimes and headsets out there, please get going, start using this, let us know what you think, let us know what you'd like to see so all of us can work together uh, and add this stuff. So um, you, can, you can get the spec, the OpenXR forums, again, chronos.org slash OpenXR and then aka.ms slash OpenXR uh, to get going, thanks. Okay, uh, thanks uh, Remy, thanks Alex, those were great demos. Let me see if I can uh, pull this back up and we'll wrap up the talk. There we go. Okay, so uh, I just wanna talk, uh, Alex pointed out a few of the resources and places to go, but I wanted to talk about what resources are available for people to go check out. So we have a 200 page specification to go uh, read up. It's it's highly technical, but um, uh, it is mainly targeting runtimes. But application uh, developers can look at them as well. We have a set of reference pages. You can look up uh, extend or look up the the functions and look up the details about how these work and and um, jump right to particular functionality that you want to look up. Uh, we also have produced a new uh, overview guide. We had one we produced for GDC for the provisional spec. This is a full. I think it's like eight pages complete detailed overview of the specification as well. Uh, we have a number of uh, GitHub repositories, the OpenXR in the Kronos group, we have OpenXR docs, which contains the source for generating the specification documents, and the OpenXR header files are there. We also have one, uh, the registry, which is similar to other Kronos APIs, which contains the specification reference pages and the overview guide. Uh, we have a new one called, uh, we got some feedback about it. it was a little bit difficult to integrate the SDK into other people's projects. So we kind of split the SDK up into an SDK source and SDK. So SDK source contains the files to generate the, the files that you would need for your project using Python and XML. But if you just want to link into your project the files that are generated, like headers, et cetera, for both building on Windows and Linux, you can go to the OpenXR-SDK repository. And if you want to take a picture, this is all the additional resources we have for OpenXR. We have the main landing page, our forum and Slack channels, uh, links to the implementations you saw here, including um, my understanding is that the Unreal Engine current preview has the OpenXR uh, 1.0 experimental plugin available as well. And then this presentation and videos should be up on our Kronos site uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, what's next, we'll be working on finishing the conformance suite and releasing conformant implementations, hopefully by the end of the year. And then we'll be looking at uh, taking the extensions that Alex talked about, and now that we have a, an established foundation for building upon, um, we can start looking at all kinds of new features we want to expose. So many thanks to all the companies to letting their, their engineers have time to dedicate to OpenXR. Also want to thank all the engineers who have put in time and effort to delivering this, a lot of them from day one, so thanks. Uh, and also I'd like the, some of the working group members that are in the room today to stand up. Uh, let's give some applause. Plus they should be here tonight. Ask them questions. Thanks. Be sure they have beer before you start asking them questions tonight. Uh, so uh, to wrap up, uh, we're running out of time, so I won't go through that, uh, but just basically want to talk about, um, hey, this is a great day for, uh, for XR. Uh, we have uh, enabled this API that will allow the end users to win to allow them to have more flexibility, more confidence in the platforms that are developing. Uh, it enables ISVs to target one API to deploy their applications and it helps vendors that support XR by providing a place and getting, leveraging the entire OpenXR ecosystem um, to bring applications to their platforms. So, thanks. Again, come tonight, we'll have the networking reception in this room and you can check out the demos and you can ask us any questions you'd like.